We're going to dive into the Bible tonight. We're really big into the Bible here at SRC. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the Word of God. It's unchanging. It's infallible. In fact, um, I'm not over the Word. I am under the Word. And here's what that means. I don't study it. It studies me. <laughs> so, so many times you might see me up here preaching and you feel like I'm preaching at you. No, no, I'm preaching at me, right? Like I find myself repenting real time. Like I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But inside I'm like, Jesus, forgive me. <laughs> and I love repentance. Why do I love repentance? I love repentance because every time I repent, I upgrade. Repentance is just an opportunity for me to upgrade. Repentance is just an opportunity for me to grow up and mature. I've grown up a lot this year. Don't amen. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, and I'm just, <laughs> no, no, don't agree with me. You know, but, you know, and, and I'm just gonna keep, just declare with me right now, I, I'm just gonna keep growing. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep, I'm just gonna keep growing. I'm just gonna keep growing in, in, into, into the image and likeness of Christ Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Good, good, good. Guys, tonight this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about um, how to church, okay? How to church. And um, now let me just say that when it comes to studying books of the Bible, um, uh, um, sometimes I wish that we could skip chapters and skip verses because there's some chapters and verses that can grow a church. And there are some chapters and verses that can shrink a church. This is one of them texts. I don't know of any mega churches that are mega churches be because of some of the verses that are here. So you'll clearly see that, that it is not our mission to create environments where people show up. That's not necessarily, because if that was our mission, we'd probably skip this text and go to something a little bit more glamorous because it gets, it gets real and, it, and, it, and it's beautiful and you're going to love it, trust me. But we're going to talk about how to church or like how not to church. And um, so let's, let's dive in. You guys ready? Okay. And before we do this, let me just, let me just tell you this. This is a little teaser for what's to come. Um, uh, we got five more weeks in 1 Corinthians. And then when we go into the fall, we are going to begin an eight-month study through the entire book of Genesis. I love your response. And do you want to know why? Because a lot of people are into the end times. Okay, they're really big into the end times. All right, if you want to know more about the end times, you need to understand the beginning. Why? Because Greeks think of beginning and end, but Hebrews don't think that way. We think in terms of a timeline. Okay, but the Hebrews think in terms of a circle, which means that the end is actually the beginning, and the beginning is. So if you want to learn about the end times, then you need to learn about the beginning. Why? Because the end is not obliteration of the earth in the rapture. <laughs> nope. <laughs> What's the end? The end is the restoration of all things. What does the end look like? Genesis 1. The lion and the lamb, riding dinosaurs, right? Like, it, it gets crazy. Uh, riding what? Okay, enough, enough. Okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. September, you have to wait, okay? September. We're going to talk about riding dinosaurs. Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 to 40. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to study through this. I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go quick. So if I go too quick, just put your hand up, ask me to slow down, and I'll slow it down. Um, otherwise, we're going to, we're going to just fire through some things. We're going to talk about how to church. I'm going to do this out of the Passion Translation. I'll explain why somewhere in the middle. Okay, and then at the very end, we're not going to just talk about the kingdom of God. We're going to demonstrate the kingdom of God. There's going to be a demonstration of the kingdom of God and a demonstration of his power. So if you came here tonight needing an encounter with the power of God, uh, you won't be let down. Is that good? Does that sound like a good plan? It sounds like he has an agenda. <laughs> yep. All right, here we go. First Corinthians <laughs> chapter 14, verse 26. Now check it. Now look at how he begins this. He says, Beloved friends, now let me just tell you something. Whenever Paul starts off by being really kind, put your cup on. Beloved friends, okay? What does all this imply? 
When you conduct your meetings, hit pause. Pause right there. Okay. Um, here's what the church looked like. Here's what the church looks like. Each week, the church would gather at the temple. So they'd do a weekly gathering at temple, and then what would they do throughout the week? They would gather in each other's homes. Scholars tell us that in Corinth, the average gathering was between 30 to 70 uh, people in, in a gathering, okay? So when you gather, okay, so they are the church. They are the called out ones, the ecclesia called out of the world, okay, and into the kingdom of God. And so they would meet a temple, okay, along with the rest of the Jewish people, but then they would meet house to house during the week where they would do church. So you are the church, the noun, the ecclesia, and what does the noun do? It churches, okay? It, going back to the spirit of murder thing and not to glorify demons, but it, it is kind of fun. So, um, you know, we did have the spirit of murder show up. He said, I am murder. And then later on, uh, the, the demon said, I want to murder. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. You got a noun, you got a verb. All right, I want you to declare, I am the church. I want you to declare, I want to church, without your voice cracking. I want to church. Yeah, so it's a noun and a verb. This is who we are, and this is how, this is how we do it. Now, when you conduct your meetings, so not talking about temple, not talking about your weekly expression, but talking about the micro expression of the kingdom, okay? Because this is what revival looks like. In Acts chapter 2, remember, the fire of God comes upon the people, and they devoted themselves to the apostolic instruction, fellowship, the Lord's Supper, prayer, miracles, the sharing of finances, praising and worshiping of, of the Lord, and evangelism. That's what revival looks like. So when you conduct your micro expression of kingdom, you should always let everything be done to build up the church family, whether you share a song of praise, a teaching, a divine revelation, or a tongue and interpretation, let each one, I'll, I'll read that again, let each person contribute what strengthens others. Okay, now some people think that the church exists to serve People. So some people think I go to church because I go to be served. No, that's why you go to Denny's. That's not why you go to church. The church does not exist to serve you. The church exists to create an environment where we come together to build up and serve one another. He says, when you gather, let each person come ready to contribute. Verse 27, if someone speaks in a tongue, because when you gather, there should be a moment where Holy Spirit begins to descend in the atmosphere, and there should be that moment when all of a sudden, that should be happening at your home groups. That should be happening when you gather. Why? Because that's what was happening in the book of Acts. He says, if someone speaks in a tongue, um, it should be two or three, but one after another. And then he says, with someone to interpret. Okay? He says, if there's no one with the interpretation, then he should remain silent in the meeting, content to speak to himself and to God. So, hey, 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 Toyota, Mitsubishi, hey, 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 right? And he stops, but nobody interprets, then he should be like, okay, I guess that's just for me. That's between me and the Lord for my own building up. But if there's, an, if there's an interpretation, what do you have? We have the spirit of prophecy, and now God is speaking to the assembly. Isn't this cool? Imagine. Imagine inviting people over to your house. Imagine you're just all hanging out. Imagine you're just enjoying each other's fellowship, and then all of a sudden you realize something. Uh-oh. We got one, two, and more. Uh-oh. And we're gathered in his name. Uh-oh. 
What does that mean? He's probably going to show up. All right, tonight is the 6 o'clock service. I got one, two, and more, okay? And we're gathered in his name, okay? Uh Uh-oh, what does that mean? He's probably going to manifest himself. He's probably going to show up. This is what he says. Let somebody bring the interpretation. Verse 29. The same is truth prophecy. Check it out. Let two or three prophets prophesy. Let the other prophet. What does that mean? It means prophets should attend small groups. <laughs> yeah. That's what it says. If, you got, if you're at it, uh, these mean two or three prophets should prophesy. And let the other prophets carefully evaluate and discern what is being said. And someone receives a revelation while somebody else is still speaking, let the one who is speaking conclude, bring it to an end, okay, to allow the person with fresh revelation the opportunity to share. How many of you have ever been in a meeting where the, there's the study of the word, the exposition of scripture, but Holy Spirit is in the room and he's, he, Holy Spirit's doing what he does. What does Holy Spirit do? He's always just I get so offended. So many times I'm the one talking, but Holy Spirit's talking to all of you at the same time. And I can tell you're no longer listening. Why? Because you're hearing from Holy Spirit. Guess what? That's the win. The perfect service looks like this. Turn in your Bibles. Okay, this is good. Mm. And at a certain point, you're like, mm, so good, Pastor Darren. I'm like, thank you. And you're like, you're taking note. But now all of a sudden, there's a point in the service, you're no longer listening to me. Why? Because Holy Ghost all up and jacked the conversation. And now Holy Ghost is speaking to you. You're no longer listening to me. And now the Holy Spirit is speaking. And this is what Paul is saying, that there are those that have been placed within the church where the, the, the teacher is teaching, but the spirit of revelation comes. And you know what Paul says to the teacher in that moment? Hey, you better wrap it up. Why? Because what you got is good, but what God has is better. And there's about to be revelation that's released. We've seen that here. We see that on a regular basis where there's the exposition of the scriptures, but all of a sudden God begins speaking and, and somebody comes up and takes the mic and they begin to add. All of a sudden, oh my goodness, God is moving and miracles start breaking out. People start getting saved and people start getting delivered of demons. What's that? That's the body of Christ. That's, that's the church. That's the people of God. That's, that's the team operating together to see blind eyes open, to see uh, uh, ears open up, to see hard hearts get soft. That's the, that's the family of God. And guess what? You can try this at home. You, you can have people over. Hey, c- come on up. We're going to eat some good food. We're going to drink some good Welch's grape juice. It's going to be awesome. Come on over. We're going to enjoy each other. We're going to enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit. We're going to gather two or more in his name, and we're just going to wait for him to show up and show off. This is what they were doing here in, in, in Corinth. But Paul's having to bring some correction, some understanding, because, because their gatherings are getting a little bit divisive and a little bit weird, as you're going to see here um, in a second. And that's, that's the entire book of, of Corinthians, by the way, isn't it? Like every week. Like you're like, they were doing what? <laughs> you know, like do we really have to have a whole Sunday on, uh, on prostitution? I, I, like thank God I'm not having to, you know, it's Corinth, you know, not SR. Okay, let's get back to the scripture. <laughs> he says, but let's go to 30. But if someone receives a revelation while someone else is still speaking, the one speaking should wrap it up and allow the one with the fresh revelation the opportunity to share. For you can all, everyone say all. all. Okay. And now in the Greek, the word all means all. You can all prophesy. And we saw just a couple weeks ago that Paul says, not only can you, you should. Okay? He says, hey, I, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. You speak in tongues all you want. You're not going to beat me. I thank God I speak in tongues more than any of you. So tongues is great, but I long that you would all prophesy. Why? Because when we prophesy, it builds up the church. It builds up the body. Okay. For your prophesy. Okay? And for when you prophesy, um, the, the, in the present, all can be instructed, encouraged, and strengthened. Verse 32. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is the God of harmony, not confusion. Have you ever received a prophetic word and you were like, Whoa, what? That's weird. That's for me? That makes no sense at all. 
but I'm going to try to assimilate it into my life, okay? And I'm going to quit my job at Amazon and, and work at the ice cream shop down the street. Why'd you do that? Well, because the prophet looked at me and said, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. I don't, horrible, horrible example, okay? <laughs> horrible example. Here, here's the, God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of confirmation. Yeah. And he says here, as is the pattern in all the churches of God's holy believers. We need to allow for prophecy in the church, but we also need to allow for the evaluation of the prophetic. This is what he says here. He says, if someone receives revelation, let them share it. If somebody receives um, a prophecy, uh, let it be uh, shared. Um, uh, uh, and in this place, begin to um, uh, uh, evaluate the prophetic. Begin, he says, to discern the word. And this is really important. Anytime you get a prophetic word, you should discern it before you receive it. The word discern means to smell. So in the kingdom, you should always smell before you eat. Before you eat it, smell it. Make sure it feels right. Make sure it thinks right. Make sure it's biblical, that it teaches right. Okay? And if it's confirming with the Spirit, how, you know what we read that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, what is, what is there? There's your spirit gets awakened and comes into harmony as your spirit begins to cry out, Abba, Father. Your spirit testifies with his spirit that you are a child of God. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you get confirmation within you and you are awakened to the reality that I'm a child. Jesus would say that that. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. So no matter how great the word, if it doesn't sound like your shepherd, it might be a good word from a good person, but it might not be from your shepherd for you. I'll give you an example. I just recently received a prophetic word from a man who said that he was supposed to be my associate pastor. And I let him know, that's great, but God has not spoke that to me. And he let me know that I'm accountable because now I've received that word. I said, actually, I'm not accountable because I'm not accountable for what you say. I'm accountable for what God says. Why would you say that, Pastor Darren? Because you need to be equipped for when somebody comes to you to put something on you that's not for you, you need to be empowered to judge the word for yourself. That just because a pastor, a prophet, an apostle, an evangelist, an incredible person gives you something to eat, it doesn't mean you have to eat it. Why? Because you're not a servant. You're not a slave. You are a powerful child of the Most High God. Your daddy is the king. And this is what Paul says, that when the prophets bring a word, the body begins to discern it. The body begins to judge it. Now, this is the part of the service, okay? I don't know if you've ever been on um, uh, Splash Mountain in Disneyland, but um, I, I've done that with, with my children. And, uh, and I will warn you, we together are basically in a log on the Splash Mountain ride right now, okay? Now, here's the thing about Splash Mountain and um, is that it's a fun ride and everything's magical and everything's Disney, okay? Everything's like, you got, you got bears, you know, singing, <laughs> you know, and you guys, everything is great. We're in a log. What, what could possibly go wrong on this magical Disney ride? Then somewhere uh, uh, towards the middle of the ride, everything starts to go wrong. Why? Because uh, the bear is no longer singing, it's a magical do, 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 do. He's no longer singing that. Why? Because now the bear, the animated Disney bear, is now looking at your log saying, it's time to turn around. And, and you're thinking, how do I turn this thing around? There's no steering wheel in this log, right? And all of a sudden, the music goes from being like, dun, 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 dun. now the music's like, bam, 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 bam. 
bah, bah. and all of a sudden the log starts going up, <laughs> like straight up, right? And now if you're Sophia, you know, who, who at this time is five years old, and the log, she's saying, Daddy, I want all of this thing, right? Right. It's no longer magical. It's getting real. And I don't know if you've been on Splash Mountain recently, but you're going straight up, and, and all of a sudden that little, fo- like that, that little rabbit that was so, that was so like, ha, ha, ha. Now, now the rabbit's being strung up by a rope, and there's a fox going, ha, 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 You know, Splash Mountain just got demonic, right? We went from, like, magical heavenly atmospheres to hell, and we're going up. Everybody on the, ro- on the, in the log knows that this thing's going straight up, and what goes up must come down. And I all of a sudden, <laughs> to, he's talking about Splash Mountain way too long. So all of a sudden, you get way, way, way up, and then what happens? And then everybody wants out of the log. That's where we're at right now. This has been fun, and, and there's a couple times you laughed, oh, Pastor Darren, huh? But, but now, this thing's about to drop. Because check it out, out of nowhere... Verse 34, Paul goes, and women should be quiet at church and not allowed to say anything at church. Women should just be quiet, sit down and shut up and don't say a thing until you get home, at which point you are permitted to ask your husband your questions. Awesome. And we're going to end with that. So I'm just going to close in prayer. I hope you're blessed tonight. I hope you're, I hope, <laughs> I hope you're encouraged tonight. I want to remind you how, 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 how the passage started. Beloved friends. Beloved friends. I wish that you would all prophesy, right? Until verse 34. Unless you're a woman. If you're a woman, exhibit, exhibit. Don't say anything. Now, <laughs> this is fun. We're having fun. You know, and, and here, here's, here's the deal. You guys, there are churches that teach this one line in isolation without context. I have been to churches myself. My bottom has sat in seats where I have heard this thought and my ears have heard this. This one verse in isolation that if you're a woman in the church, your role is to sit down and shut up. You have no place in the church to teach anything unless it's in the Sunday school. If it's in the Sunday school, you know, you know, Beth Moore one of, it can teach the Bible better than most men in the church. And there are churches where she has to seek the permission of elders to be granted a one-time pass that a woman can stand in the pulpit, not as a new pattern, but as an exception so that she can teach the word of God in some churches. Why? Because of this one line. And this is why I wanted to read it out of the Passion Translation. Why? If, I, if, I, if you've never heard this before, I want you to remember this. Context determines meaning. Which means this. Whenever I teach the Bible at SRC, I'll never teach you one verse. I will always teach you a couple verses before and a couple verses afterwards. Why? We are not allowed to take one verse and to bend it in order to meet our, uh, our token revelation or our manipulative agenda. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen this used, and I've had conversations with countless women who've been abused by their Christian husbands and told scriptures out of Ephesians of, woman, submit, I am the head of the house, your role is to submit. I've seen Christian husbands use the word of God, not as a sword, not as a scalpel, but as a baseball bat, not for the glory of God, but for their own manipulative agenda. That's a sin. 
We do not use, you could be a male or a female, we do not use the word of God to manipulate people to get what we want out of people. The context here is not women sit down and be quiet. I'm going to give you the context. Are you ready? Here's what was happening. You got the people of God coming together. Okay, all of a sudden there's a tongue and all of a sudden there's a prophetic word. And what would they do? They wouldn't move on with the rest of the service. There, there were men, established leaders in the church that would begin weighing out the prophetic word real time. Why? Because in the first century, a prophetic word was not a luxury, it was a necessity. Meaning this, that in the first century church, when you got a prophetic word, it wasn't just, you're loved and the Lord loves your hair. No, no, this is a time when people are losing their lives for the sake of the gospel. And if God spoke, you better be quick to respond. You better be quick to obey. Why? Because the, the establishing of the gospel in cities and nations was contingent on what God was releasing to the local church. That means you could get a prophetic word and one night that could save your family for another week. We are about to step into a new gravity in the church where there is an honor restored to the prophetic where we as the body of Christ can rightly divide the soul from the spirit from knowing a word of flattery from a true word from God that has the ability to change the trajectory of a city or a nation and such a word could be released through a child or through a woman because because Paul said, I long that you all prophesy, you can all prophesy, but when it came to the weighing or the discerning of prophetic words in this context, they would take the time out and it would be men who would evaluate the prophetic word. And during times of evaluation, there was a spirit of division that was coming into the church because they could not get agreement on whether or not the word was from God or not of God. The word women here is translated wives. It is not speaking of all women in general. It is speaking of wives who are speaking up in defense of their husbands. This would be Darren giving a prophetic word in a group. It would be Roy saying, I don't believe that's the timing of God of that word. I don't think we can receive that word now because if we do, it could be dangerous for the local church because of the gravity of what you just spoke. I'm worried about receiving that word. And then it's Andrea standing up saying, what the heck are you talking about? Don't you know who my husband is? Don't you know his prophetic accuracy and statistics? And then it's Victory speaking up and telling Andrea, you should sit down. You should listen to my husband. My husband's about to save the church. And then you get the idea. It's, it's, the, it's the men that have spoken up, and then it's the women, and they've got these, these feuds and these fights. And this is, what, this is what Paul says. He says, to the bickering wives, they should protect the unity of the church and protect the atmosphere. And then when they get home, counsel and connect with their husbands. This is not a letter to Seattle Revival Center. This is a letter to a specific situation in a literal city and a literal time. It does not say women sit down, shut up, and do not teach. This scripture says all should prophesy, all can prophesy, but if you're causing division, you should probably shut up. And that is a big difference from a theology or a doctrine that commands you to take your place and to disappear based off of your gender. Don't you see now how context determines meaning? It, it's not hard. Now, that's important. Why? Because there are churches today teaching a liberal theology that says, and you can find this on the net, you can find anything on the net, that this text does not exist, that this scripture for, for order in the church in regards to gender is not a part of the original manuscript. And you need to know there are churches teaching in Seattle, you know, it's going to an extreme. Women should be quiet to, to men should be quiet. Over here, women should just shut up to, to over here. Men should just shut up. Swinging all the way over here saying that this text is not in the Bible. It is. 
The debate is not whether or not this exists in the original manuscript. The debate is where does it fit in the original manuscript? Because in some first century manuscripts, this exhortation is earlier in the text. In other manuscripts, it's later in the text. But all scholars believe it's in the text. Why is, you're like, who cares? You should care. You're in Seattle. You're, you're in a city where there's two agendas. And what I would say is, it's not about the man of God. And it's not about the woman of God. It's not about that women should be quiet. It's not that men should be quiet. It's what does God have to say and how do we work together to serve one another so that the voice of the Lord can be heard, that the prophetic word can be stewarded, and how can we come together as the family of God? A family consists of a daddy and a mommy, and they don't position themselves over each other, and they don't say, you should submit to my authority. No, no, no. That's insecurity. That's immaturity. That a, a family consists of a man of God, a woman of God, together, united, one flesh, leading together with their differences, with their different anointings, with a diversity kind of thing taking place. And you see within this place, Paul would say, if you want to know who God is, the only way I can explain it is through marriage. You, you see, the submit text has nothing to do with women submit to your, no, the submit text has nothing to do with marriage. The submit to your husband's text has everything to do with the revelation of the Trinity. Read it. He says, if I'm going to explain to you the mystery that is the Godhead, I'm going to have to show you the mystery that is marriage. <laughs> Context determines meaning. Women, don't shut up, please. We need to hear you. We don't need to hear you roar. We need to hear your holy, blessed, beautiful, feminine voice. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a dude. You be you. And at times there will be a militant authority on you. And at other times there will be a, a beautiful, tangible grace. You be who you are in Christ and know that God is for you. He's not looking to put you in a box somewhere. He's not looking to hide you. That's what religion does. Because you are this, go away. But the gospel says, you're celebrated. You are a celebrated daughter in the house of God. You are a celebrated son. In that. Religion's always saying, you're disqualified. Ah, too many divorces. Ah. Religion's always saying, you know, <laughs> how's a polite way to say this? You're sleeping with dudes all the time, so we're going to kill you because that's what the law says to do. But the gospel of the kingdom is not a religion. The gospel of the kingdom says, yeah, sure, under the law you deserve to die. But underneath the gospel of the kingdom... You are loved. He who is without sin, throw the first stone. You're loved. You're accepted. Woman, rise. In the kingdom of God, we restore people's innocence and their value and their dignity. We do not throw them out with the trash because of a decision that they made that was not wise. That's what religion does. It throws people away as trash. The gospel of the kingdom says, we work for the king, therefore we get into the trash bins because we don't believe that people are trash. We believe that people are treasures. So we find our treasures in the trash bin. We find the people that religion threw out. And we work with the king to restore their dignity, their value, their identity, and their destiny. Good. Now, verse 36. What happens in verse 36? Paul defends his apostolic authority. You say, I thought we were, we're, we're Christians. We're not supposed to defend ourselves, okay? Um, if you know who you are, you'll fight to protect your identity. If you don't know who you are, you'll believe the voice of the accuser, and you'll bow to a false identity. Yeah, so if you don't know who you are, when the accusation comes, you might believe the accusation. And you might apologize for things that you haven't even done. Why? Because if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what you do. Paul knows who he is, so there's accusation about who he is, and he defends his authority. Also, the first revival in the New Testament happens in Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit shows up, and then the mockers show up. That's a precedent. 
Every time the Holy Spirit shows up, the mockers will always show up. Well, don't, don't address your critics. Don't defend yourself. If Peter would have not stood up to address the critics and the mockers, we would have missed out on the very first harvest where the church goes from 120 to 3,000 in a day. Holy Spirit shows up, the mockers show up, and then Peter shows up to defend the move of God, and the mockers become believers, and that's how the, uh, the apostolic church gets started there in Jerusalem. When your mocker shows up, give thanks and glory to God. Why? Because that mocker is going to become a believer, and they're going to eat their words, you know, and, uh, and the Lord's going to convert them. Yep. Mocking's just an opportunity to release the kindness and the love of God. The kindness of God brings people to transformation. So how does Paul do it? Do you, look at how he does it. Do you actually think that you were the starting point for the word of God going forth? <laughs> nope. Were you the only ones it was sent to? He answers himself, yeah, I don't think so. If anyone considers himself to be a prophet or a spiritual person, let him discern what I'm writing to you carries the Lord's authority. Check it out, verse 38. And if anyone continues not to recognize this, he should not be recognized. This is what he says. If there's anyone in your camp that does not recognize my apostolic authority, don't recognize theirs. Jeez. That's awesome. Verse 39. Then he responds. My beloved friends, <laughs> with, it, with all this in mind, be passionate. I want to say be passionate. To do what? To prophesy. And don't forbid anyone from speaking in tongues. Doing all things in a beautiful and orderly way. The reading of the word. How many of you guys right now are like, that's in my Bible? That's lit. That's what the... That's what the young people are saying these days. And I know that because I'm young. <laughs> this, is what I, this is what I do. I'm going to pray real quick, okay? And then I'm, we're going we're gonna to pull some gold nuggets out of this, okay? Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that we have been called out of the world and into your beautiful, glorious ecclesia. And that you are recalibrating the church in this season. You are realigning our hearts in this season. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for how you're upgrading us this year. Lord, we thank you that we are not an accident, that you created us with a specific intent, that you've redeemed us and you are restoring us and you are positioning us in this season to arise and shine and reveal your glory and righteousness on the earth. Father, we thank you for your specific assignments even this coming week. And Father, we pray that you would prepare us tonight for the opportunities that are going to open up and expand even in the next seven days. Thank you, Lord. We are the church. We get to church. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is how we church. Okay, how to church. Number one, be involved. Everyone declare it with me. Be involved. Okay, this is what Paul says at the very beginning here. He says, when you church, let, let each one contribute, okay? When you church, let each person show up ready to offer something, ready to give something. So when you gather, gather with expectation, meaning this. Don't come to church like you go to Starbucks, okay? Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to hit up. I'm not going to lie, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit up Starbucks. And um, it's going to be Monday. <laughs> and um, I'm going to order a drink for my wife that takes about 15 minutes, okay? And I'm going to uh, maybe order just myself just a black coffee. It takes two seconds, okay? And I'm going to do it with my brain not even engaged, okay? I'm going to be half asleep. I'm going to still be re re recuperating from today, praise God. You know, and, um, and I'll put it, you know, and they're going to give me the, the and, and by Tuesday afternoon, I'll be waking up, okay? By Wednesday, I'll be like, 
ready to conquer the world again, okay? Now you know my pattern. I'm just confessing sin here. That, that's, 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 how, that's, that, that's, how, that's Darren's groove, okay? And I'm going to hit the gym, and it'll be good. I'll be lifting weights, but my brain won't even be, I'll be like, Ugh! but my brain will just be, this is me. This is how I rest. I rest, I drink some coffee, I lift a bunch of weights. It's not even about the weights. It's just about nothing. It's just like, I don't have to think about, it's just like, this is how I rest, okay? This is how we church. This is how Darren rests, okay? Now, um, some of us go to church the way that I go to Starbucks on Monday mornings. Right? You come in through the door. Welcome to SRC. You know, <laughs> you, know you come in. Worship teams, they're doing their thing. They're, they're, they're on. First song. <laughs> Second song. <laughs> right? Um, Third song, what? oh, yes, I'm no longer saved to fear, I'm a, now you're saved again. <laughs> now you're a Christian song. It took three, you're, you're Christian. It took three songs, but now you're like, now you're having your own little revival. Oh, yes, I am the righteousness of Christ. Oh, yes, I am a kind person. Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Oh, yes, I'm an American again, okay? <laughs> I'm not a monster, okay? You know, and then awesome. And then that last till Sunday night, you wake up on Monday. Ah, all right. And, and then we, 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 do, we, do, <laughs> we do our thing. Um, this, is what the, this is what the Lord's calling for us to do. He's calling for us to begin to live an awakening lifestyle, a lifestyle of faith and expectation, where each day we pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread, and I expect today, I prayed it this morning, I prayed it yesterday, I expect unexpected blessing and opportunity, opportunity to reveal the glory of God. You have permission to interrupt me. I I have expectation that, Lord, you're going to use me as an agency for the kingdom of God. I shared this with our A-team before the service. We were out there hanging out and um, uh, before the service. And I said to them, something that the Lord spoke to me this last week. And if you're a part of another church, you know, I apologize. But I basically said to them, hey, the Lord spoke to me and said, Seattle Revival Center, track with me here, is a move of God. This is what he spoke to me. Seattle Revival Center is a move of God. And, I could, and, and, and we, could, we, we could offer some incredible evidence of that. We don't need to brag. We don't need to boast. We don't need to. But we are seeing God show up through the people, through the people of God each and every week. Therefore, you need to know because of the tribe, you're not you're not who you are because of the decisions that you make. You are who you are because of the tribe that you are a part of. And if you are a part of Seattle Revival Center, you need to have a posture of expectation. Why? Because of the tribe that you have chosen to identify with, because of the tribe that you are a part of. If you're a part of this tribe, you need to be expecting unexpected blessing and unexpected opportunities. We just shared this story recently with Jessica. You know, I, 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 I had an opportunity to go and to uh, help a family out because their house was haunted. This is just two weeks ago. Haunted house, stuff moving. We're talking like poltergeist stuff, you know, moving stuff and, and you know, creepy Hollywood kind of kind of fun stuff. You know, and so they reached out to Jessica. Hey, we need help. Awesome. Why did they reach out to Jessica? Because of the tribe that she has chosen to associate herself with. She has an expectation that she's going to be needed. It's beautiful. She wrote out a salvation prayer. The entire family received Jesus. They prayed the salvation prayer every single night. Jessica, Pastor Gail, the team went in. They rebuked the devil. They rebuked hell. Guess what? It's not haunted anymore. Guess what else? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Guess what else? There's an entire family that loves Jesus, that's serving Jesus, that before did it. And guess what? That's, that's the second haunted house this month. I told her, I said, you know, it's, it's already trademarked, but you're going to start a Ghostbusters ministry, you know? <laughs> you gather with expectation, which means this. Don't come to SRC like you go to Starbucks. Ah! 
Yes, I'll get a venti, you know, whatever your thing is. No, come with expectation. God's going to move today. God's going to do some things today. He's going to use me today. What's he going to use you to do? To build up the body. I'm not just coming to be served. I'm coming to serve. I'm coming to serve the Lord with gladness. I'm coming to join in with all creation to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Sure, there's some stuff in my life that's going on. That's, that's, that's whatever. You know, sure, there's, 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 I even got my feelings, you know, and I was honest with you guys which I won't be, no, I will be, that as a pastor, sometimes I don't even feel like coming. And I got a five-minute drive to repent, get my mind right, get, get into the right place. Why? Because when I get here, I'm not coming to receive. That when I come here, I'm not coming to be served by you. That when I come here, I'm not just coming to a church me. That when I drove here tonight, you can talk to my son who is in the car with me. I, when I drive here, I'm driving to the front lines. That when I'm speaking tonight, this is my battle line. That when I'm speaking tonight, I'm fighting for hope. I'm fighting for victory. Why? Because there are marriages in this room that are on the line. There are lives in this room that are on the line. And I show up and I don't say, I hope God shows up. My expectation is that I'm going to stink and show up. I'm not just going to, I'm not just going to be here. I'm going to stink and be here. I'm not bragging, but when I come here, I don't come here like I go to Starbucks. I come here like I'm going to a fight on a playground. I come here, I come here like I'm going to go confront the bully on the playground and say enough is enough. I come here with my fight music on. I come here ready to rock. I come here ready to kick the devil's butt. I come here with expectation, and when we gather, we gather with preparation. When you're expecting, you begin preparing. You're preparing your heart. You're preparing your mind. You're getting things right. And when you go to your home group, you're not just going there like zombie wants a latte. Ugh, coffee. No, no, no. You're not a zombie. You're a son of righteousness. You're a daughter of hope. You're an agent of reconciliation and redemption. And religion says you're not ready yet. You're not holy enough yet. Religion says a lot of, a lot of stuff to tell you that you have to stuff. Religion will tell you a lot of stuff to always be disqualifying you. Disqualify. Religion will convince you that evolution is true. That you're just evolved plasm on a, that that became an ape, you know, that became a thing, that became this, this, or this, or that. But this is what the gospel, <laughs> this is what the gospel of the kingdom says. That in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve with a deliberate intent, and that when he created you, he had just as much intent as in his heart as when he created Adam and Eve. He created them, he gave them an assignment, he gave them a mission, and he was serious. That Paul says, I've been called of God, I've been ordained of God, I've been anointed by God. The same thing is true for you. You're not an ape. Evolution is a myth. You are, you are a divine creation, created in the image and likeness of God. You are not an accident. And religion says, just sit down, shut up. Mind your own business, and the gospel of the kingdom is, is this. This is your time to figure out who you are, to figure out what God has called you to do, and to speak up and to defend your identity and your destiny. Because if you're not willing to fight for you, you won't be willing to fight for others. It's time that the church gets her fight back. It's time for the church gets her voice back. It, yeah, it's time for men of God to get their voice back. We got a lot of lions that have lost their roar. It's like the Wizard of Oz around here. You got a bunch of tin men that lost their brain trying to find a wizard. Uh, bad second bad illustration for the night. We gather, <laughs> if I only had a brain, gather with expectation, we gather with preparation, and we gather with intent. To do what? Not to be served, but to collaborate together, to, to be in an environment where we're building each other up in the Lord. This is how we church. We are the church, and this is how we church. Number two, be submitted. Oh, really? We're going to do that? Yes. Roy, would you get up here? Come on, welcome Roy as he comes. All 
All right, dude, uh, come, come right here. Okay, this is how the churches look, okay? Submission means open hands, open hearts, open minds, we're open, okay? That's what submission means. Now, uh, if we're not submitted, close hands, close heart, close mind. If we're not submitted, I'm not thinking about you, I'm thinking about me. I come to church, thinking about me, it's all about me. Now, Roy here has, 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 needs to confront me on something. What does that look like? It looks like a punch, okay? I'm guarded. His correction feels like a violation against my identity. What do I do? I hit back, okay? We're not submitted to one another. We're superior. We're only thinking about ourselves. We're using our gifts, our talents, and our abilities to defend ourselves, okay? And we use the prophetic to correct each other, but it's not out of love. It's out of punishment, and this is what a lot of churches look like. You beat me up too. Okay, you get, the, you get the idea. All right. So then what's the problem? The problem is I'm the authority. The problem is I'm the pastor. I'm in charge. So you need to submit to my authority. Right? The problem is he needs to submit. Okay. Submit. Right. Which means go ahead and open up your hands. The biblical way is this. He has open hands, open heart, open mind, but I'm in charge. So I get to remain like this. Okay? Now I instruct you, I rebuke you, I challenge you, and this is what I call edification. I am building you up. But you have no right to tell me anything. Why? I'm the authority. Okay? I'm the authority. It's that my authority. Ah. Ah. The problem with this is Jesus. Jesus did not look like this. What did Jesus look like? Open hands, open heart, open mind, and he washed the feet of his disciples. Now, you see on the screen there is a dollar sign, right? What does that mean? It means that I can release value when we are mutually submitted to one to another, which is what Paul's talking about, what Paul's demonstrating. I can release value into Roy's life. How do I release value? The truth. If I release truth in love and Roy receives it, he upgrades. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but dung Poo-poo, dookie, caca, <laughs> crap are the kisses of a fool. When we go around, how you doing? I'm doing great. God bless you. Pfft, what's that? There's no value in that. How about this? How about stop asking people how they're doing? Why? Because we're supposed to be open Handed, open-hearted, open-minded. So we have a few seconds together today. How can we connect? How can I build you up? How can you build me up? Bro, God has called you. He has anointed you. Bro, when I saw you today, I saw bigness in you. I saw growth in you. I saw the kingdom expanding because of you. How is that? Is that a little bit better than, how's it going, bro? And you say, and then you ask me, How are you? I'm good, deuces. There's no value in that. We're submitted to each other. And, and yeah, I have a job description. He has a job description, but we're submitted to each other. It means our hands are open so we can give and then you can receive, put it on top of me. And then we do not exist to make each other happy. We exist to make each other holy. So you can tell me the truth, and what does it do? It builds me up, it brings me up, and I can tell you the truth, and it brings you up, and it builds you up. It hurts so good, being submitted to each other. Yeah, and we're going to bring each other up, bro. Come on, man. Love you. Awesome. And then last but not least, when you gather, gather passionately, meaning this. We need to be accountable for the disposition of our soul when we come together. You tracking with me? The fruit of the Spirit is what? 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and, gentle, and, and self-control. Okay, gentleness and self-control. What does that mean? That when we gather, let's make sure that we're fruitful, that we can share of this fruit with one another. Here's some love. Here's some joy. Here's some peace. Don't have a lot of patience. Maybe I'll get some of that from you. We're the family of God. This is, what we, this is what we do. And we don't just do it. This is how we church. We church passionately. We gather passionately, which means that when I show up, I am here, I am connected, I am present. Why? Because I'm going to create something here where I can bring you up to where God wants and you can bring me up. Guess what? Yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm here to serve you. But guess what? You are a royal son and daughter of the most high God and you are here to serve me. We are submitted to each other and that means that I can't get to where God has taken me without you. We're in this, we're in this together. And as I, I believe this all my heart because we're part of the kingdom of God, as I enter into desires fulfilled that is a dream of, that is a tree of life, I believe that to the tribe, that subverts the spirit of hope deferred. Which means this, that if you succeed, I don't become jealous of your success. Why? Your success is the testimony of Jesus that releases a spirit of prophecy where I can celebrate your success and it creates a realm that makes my success inevitable. I want to be a part of a tribe where every person in the tribe is crazy successful. And if one person isn't, the rest of the tribe comes and we pull the other one up. We pull the other one up to our level. I want to be surrounded by kings. Why? Because they'll pull me up to their level. And then guess what I'll do? I will pull my friends and tribe up to my level. What is all this up? What is all this? Why do you keep talking about building up? Because that's what we're to do as the church. That's what the church does. You get built up. The kingdom of God gets built up. And then before you know it, we're doing really crazy cool stuff. And I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about signs, wonders, miracles, and haunted houses. I love all that. We're going to do all that. But I'm talking about buying apartment complexes and turning them into transitional homes. I'm talking about buying gas stations and hiring guys that can't get jobs and giving them jobs at gas stations. I'm talking about buying recording studios, media agencies. I'm talking about, you know, that we're not, that if we can't find favor in an industry, we just buy out the industry. Where we don't complain. Why? Because when there's injustice, we deal with it. Where we break all lies that we are powerless and that we're living underneath the effects of unwise choices and that we ascend over cosmic wisdom. That's how our series started, remember? Talking about untethering from cosmic wisdom and tethering to spiritual wisdom, which exists above all created order. This is how we church. We're not a cute little box on the corner. We're not, a, we're not a one day a week event. We are the people of God. We are not a religion. We're not in this thing for the goosebumps. We're in this thing for the restoration of cities and nations. This is how we church. Well, that's, that's, that's everything I want to cover. Just to clear, I'm going to be involved this year. That means flesh and blood in the building together. That doesn't mean just on Zoom calls. It means we're together. We're stinking engaging. Flesh and blood. You track, yeah? That we're submitted. Open-handed, open-hearted. And that we get our heads back in the game. We start showing up. Okay, here we go. We only do that. Okay, I need, um, I need uh, Sonora, Jessica, uh, Cindy, come on up. I need John Shada, come on up. 
Hallelujah. Mm. I need Eric. Come on up. Yeah, come on up. Yeah, you, we can do that here. We can do that here. And you guys um, are going to get prophetic words for people that are, that are here. And you guys are going to be ambassadors of hope and freedom and life. You're going to just release life words. It's going to be really cool. And here's, you have permission um, to take somebody else's prophetic word. Because we're, because I do it all the time. Uh, like, if you ever hear me tell stories, I'm like, and I got this really cool prophetic word. It doesn't mean it was actually given to me. It just means that I took it by faith. Why? Because faith takes it. Just declare it right now. Faith takes it. In fact, I've been in meetings where, where, where prophetic words given to, to somebody, and I stand up here on the front row. Why? Because it wasn't actually for them. It was actually for me. <laughs> and what you guys are going to do is you're going to actually give a specific word to somebody here. And I know you guys have all done this before, but it's actually going to be easier than it's ever been before because the Holy Spirit's here and he's just and this is what we do and this is what Paul said to do he says you can all speak in tongues that's all cool but what I really want is that you all prophesy why because when you prophesy the church gets built up so some of you you're going to leave here two inches taller than when you came and then here's the other thing if you don't get a prophetic word when we're done you can come up to the front and when the ministry team says how can I pray for you? Say, yeah, I'm here for my word. <laughs> you probably don't need that. You guys look, okay. Okay, awesome. You ready to go? All right. Holy Spirit, we just honor you. And Jesus, we just ask that you just come into the room right now. That you come in the really cool way that you do and just go face to face with each and every person here. Lord, I pray, Lord, that even as we're just engaging, Lord, biblically uh, 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 in this practice, God, as we practice prophecy, Lord, we ask that your spirit would come and that, Lord, your spirit would bring life, Lord, even to barren wombs and that in the place where there's been hope deferred or the inability to not believe, Lord, that there'd be faith deposited into people's hearts, Lord, that we would receive a breakthrough for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, John, you getting anything, bud? It's David. David. Yeah. Anyway, I feel like the Lord is saying, like, I saw this precious, uh, like, vessel, like a, like a vase or something that, a container that's highly valued and that it was broken and it is shattered into many pieces. And uh, I just saw that that, that represents your life and that God is putting it back together and every joint every piece that comes together is like he's using a super glue <laughs> that has this uh, has this beautiful highlights to it like it's it's not just gonna have some funny lines in it but they're gonna just be sparkling they're going to be uh, so beautiful that it'll be a more beautiful vessel than it was before. It was precious before, but afterwards it's like out of this world. It's like something that everybody just, wow, wow, is that, you know? And so that's what I saw the Lord doing in your it's life. Cool. And um, yeah, so I just want to bless you with that. Thank you. Awesome, John, that's an amazing word. Uh, David, why don't you stand up? John, you go pray for him over there, okay? Isn't that awesome? Come on. I like the, the, the beautiful super glue kind of thing. Cindy, what's up? Putting you on the spot tonight. I know. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. All right, I sweet. You can Spirit rebuke me. I can handle it. I'm submitting. Yeah, I've never done this before. This is your first time? Yes. I'm so stinking proud of you. <laughs> this is so great. High five. Hey. Guys, oh, this is you. her first time. <laughs> Yes. But you know on. it's not me, right? That's right. So it's the Holy Spirit speaking. So what I'm seeing is a picture of a merry-go-round, and it's actually for the woman over here that has the mask on. Oh, yeah, right yes. here. Yeah. Uh -huh. So 
um, I'm picturing a merry-go-round, how the horses go up and down, and that there are people riding the horses around with you, wow. and there are ups and there are downs, and but there's music going on, and there's joy in the background, and so I just, uh, I want to declare over you community in the Lord, and through ups and downs, and that there's joy there for you with connectedness that way. That's so good. What, what's your name? What is it? Mila? P. Pila. That's, that's awesome. I'm getting close. Hey, stay standing. Cindy, you can go, you can go pray for her. That was a beautiful word. I think, I think you get A plus on that. That's great. Come on. Isn't that cool? She's going to pray for you. Building, building up the church. He who prophesies, he who speaks in tongues, speaks to God right? Opening up intimate mysteries in the spirit. But he who prophesies builds up the church. Amen. Come on. Amen. This girl's so cool. I love Jessica. All right, go. Thank you. Love you, Pastor D. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, this is for the woman with the, like, the bun. She's sitting next to the guy with the hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, I just, I saw, well, not I saw. I see, uh, and then I say I see, huh? It's Sorry, I'm trying to formulate this in my mind. I feel that you believe that you're invisible and that nobody sees you and that God doesn't see you. And so I'm just here tonight to say that's not the case, that God does see you. We do see you. You are a beautiful woman of God. You have... Um, so much uh, uh, talent and creative abilities and it feels like maybe they're not being used or you don't have the opportunity to use them but I see that God's going to um, open a door and start making a way for you but I also feel this this level of, of courage you know I, I, I just feel like uh, praying the spirit of uh, Joshua over you that, uh, that anointing, you know, show up courageous, show up bold, you know, show up mighty for God because he does see you. He has his arms wrapped around you. He is directing your paths even now. So you're not invisible, but sometimes God hides us until it's time to be presented out front. And I feel like this is a, a hidden period but it is also a time, as Pastor Darren would say, with expectation, there's preparation. And this is your time of preparation. Yeah, that's good. But God does see you. He loves you. Um, you're the apple of his eye. You are just his heart. And um, yeah, I just feel like things are going to really start changing as you step out in faith and these uh, opportunities start arising to say yes come out your comfort zone, um, increase your faith, and, and just say yes to God, and he'll do it. So good, so good. Yeah, I saw the same thing. I saw like, a, I saw like a, a shaft of light come on you, and the Lord is like, the Lord is like uh, clothing you with light, and, uh, and the light's coming on you and into you. I just see that the glory of the Lord is going to come to you in a fresh way, and it's going to transform you. So the glory of the Lord will come on you and into you, and then it's going to reveal you. And so get ready. You're in a season of transition. And I'm going to send Jessica to come lay her hand on you and just bless you, OK? Good word, Jessica. You're awesome. Well, Sonora, what's up? You, did she take, oh, you got the mic. Good. Um, so this word is for, I think it's Andrea. Yep, yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, um, the Lord has actually been speaking to me about you this whole service. And what I want to encourage you with is that is to breathe. And what I saw was that you kind of have been living life with like kind of holding your breath, kind of waiting for the attack or waiting for... Um, whatever's gonna happen, you've kind of been living from a place of, I have to protect myself. And so um, I just wanna encourage you in the Lord that the Lord's saying, I am the breath of life. 
and that if you would just breathe in my presence, if you would just breathe in who I am, if you would breathe in and embrace who I've called you to be, mighty woman of God, you will be able to begin to see, you'll be able to move faster so you'll see acceleration because you actually have the wind that's gonna carry you forward. And so I want to say um, that you don't have to live your life from a place of um, being on attack mode, but rather because you are a daughter, a daughter of the king, you can live from victory because the truth of the matter is it, you win. You win in this life because he won. And so I just wanna bless you in that, that you can breathe in the breath of life who is Jesus and he is going to be the wind beneath your sails. So good, so good. Go get her, Sonora. Bless you, Andrea. Eric, my man, yes, good to yes. see you, dude. Saved for the last. Come on, that's right. That's right. The best wine, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's funny because um, going last, I felt like the Lord did highlight a person, in, but I think it's another Angela. But also, it was the same word that you had of the, the spotlight oh, okay. on her. And um, Gabriel, I, I met your friend before the service tonight, and I feel like the, the Lord's been highlighting her. Is this, is it Angela? Angela? Hey, Angela. <laughs> this might be something new for you. Um, I got to meet you before the service. But uh, throughout the service, I feel like the Lord's been highlighting you. And just like Pastor Darren had shared with the spotlight, um, I feel like the Lord is, is wanting to bring you into the spotlight. You kind of uh, feel like you might have felt like you're in the shadows or in the background. And, uh, but God wants to reveal His love for you. He wants to bring you into the spotlight. He wants to love you with a Father's love, a Father's heart. Um, and, and bring the healing to your heart and bring intimacy and relationship uh, to you. Um, so yeah, I feel like, yeah, I'm just to stand in this place and as Papa God just saying, Angela, I love you with an eternal love. Wow, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it's, there's no coincidence and no chance that, uh, that you came here with Gabriel tonight because God wanted to speak to you and say he loves you deeply. So, bless you, Angela. Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah, super yeah. cool, super yeah, cool. Yeah. Eric, why don't you grab Pastor Gail and you guys can both go over there and just minister to Angela. I'm so glad that you're here, sweetheart. It's so, so, so good. Okay, awesome. And um, we're just about done, um, which is good because some of you are already thinking about Taco Bell. Um, and I don't judge you, don't blame me for that. All right, but, but the, the brother right here in the glasses, I met you before the service, but I forgot your name. What's your name? What is it? Al. Okay, that's right. I saw golden nails. And so it's like you got the hammer and you're ready to build, but it's like you got to have the nails to keep it together. And the Lord says he's giving you uh, nails of glory and purity and integrity so that what you build stays and remains. So I just, I bless you. I bless you with, uh, I bless you with that. Lee. Good to see you, my man. Come on. I see they that wait on the Lord, he'll renew their strength and they'll rise up on wings of eagles and they'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. It's a new season, which means that you're going to get to do the old race again, but this time you're going to finish the marathon. It's like people that train and train and train. They try for the marathon, but maybe they can't finish it for whatever reason. But the Lord says you're about to run an old race again, but this time you're going to succeed and you're going to run across the finish line and it's going to be effortless. So I just bless you with that. They that wait on the Lord, he'll renew their strength. The, the brother here, I met you before, Jerry. Is it Jerry? Okay, awesome. I see just a beautiful honor and legacy on your life. I just see integrity. I see honor. I see value. I see the love of the Father. The Lord wants you to know you're a good papa. And I see you fathering not just your own children, but other people's children. It's like you're a, you're a safe place and you, you have a fun way that you father. I see that like you're a fun father and I see you just creating this place where people just, all, they always feel at home in your home. And I, and I, and I feel like the Lord's going to give you a fresh, 
anointing on this place of fathering and discipleship. It's going to be easy. It won't be a burden. And it's just you being you, but the Lord's going to add his super to your natural. So I just bless you and that I bless your home. I even see a healing anointing coming on your home where people walk into your home and they just get radically healed without anyone even praying for them just because of the atmosphere uh, that's in that place. This couple at the very back with the glasses and, and, the, and the dude man right there. Good to see you. I just bless you. I see such wisdom and favor on your life. I see you. I've uh, been in a place of growing in wisdom and in favor, but I see that there's connections that are starting to come together. Almost like you've had a lot of puzzle pieces, but you've been like trying to play on the puzzle, trying to make things fit and see where, the, where the, but I just see you're coming into a new season where it's just, it's easy. And all of a sudden it's like, it's, it's the same puzzle, but now you just see how things fit and they just start coming together. So I believe that there's new relationships that are coming together, new opportunities maybe even uh, new employment type opportunities and it's just it's just going to fit it's just going to make sense and you're going to see the big picture and that's going to be really cool because you've been asking God what's the big picture in this like what's the long term kind of thing look like so I bless you with wisdom because you've been asking God for that and for favor which will manifest as opportunities okay get ready for new opportunities that'll be really good uh, Haley I bless you and the new adventures I see you like Indiana Jones in the spirit dun, 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 dun. ready for fun ready for adventure but the Lord says that, that he's actually going to create some opportunities where you're going to learn um, not just more about yourself. You've been in this season of self-discovery, but he says he's going to actually teach you about people and about the heart of man and that th there's going to be some things that you see that are that are painful but are also redemptive because God's going to, he's about to give you a set of new keys and these keys will unlock hearts and you're going to need not just wisdom, but you're going to need knowledge. And I want to see that the Lord's preparing you almost like in the same way that somebody would go to school to learn about um, like to be a psychiatrist, the understanding of the mind, but I see you stepping into a place of infused knowledge where you will have the knowledge, you'll know how to navigate through situations. It'll be offensive to some people because they'll say, why would you talk that way and why would you do that? And it looks like compromise, but it's not actually compromise. The Lord's giving you the blueprint or the map, the GPS to navigate the intricate and complicated thing that is the human heart. And the Lord says he's going to unlock hardened hearts. And so get ready. But I do think there's going to be an element to it where you're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be overwhelming because you're going to see so much stuff that exists within the hearts of man. And you're going to get a revelation of what Jesus felt as he hung on the cross and died for all of humanity and stood in that place that said, Father, forgive them. They really know not what they do. So I really see a beautiful impartation of the Father's heart into your heart. It's, it, it's going to be overwhelming, but the Lord says you can handle it because there's a grace for it. There's a special grace. So don't let the overwhelming thing become overwhelming in and of itself. Just remind yourself there's a grace for this. The Lord's taking me deep deep into this awareness so that I can minister with an efficiency and an effectiveness. Uh, yeah, and, and I also just see the Lord all, the reminding, reminding you to trust him because he will not leave you high and dry. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will not abandon you. And he will make sure that you're not isolated. He's going to surround you with a company of like-hearted people that have your back, okay? So just bless you. I bless you in that. Yeah. And sweetheart, what's your name? What is it? Becky? Becky? Awesome. I just bless you. I see, I see transition. I see the winds of change blowing all, all around you. In fact, I see the winds of change blowing around you and picking you up. And so I think the Lord's going to pick you up and it's going to, it's going to be like, it's not going to be like the Lord picking you up like a little baby saying, you come here. It's going to be like, wow. It's going to be like wild. It's the winds. It's, it feels chaotic. It's going to be like, but you're going to realize that right there in the middle of all the chaos is the tenderness of your father. And he's going to pick you up and he's going to bring you really close to yourself. So don't fear the wah, don't fear the wah, because the Father's in it, and he's going to bring you right into his heart, okay? Awesome, awesome, awesome. And that's what we all do. And why do we do that publicly? Couldn't I go to her and just share that with her privately? No, because we model this publicly, because what I just did, you can do, and do a lot better than I just did. We model this publicly because this is with the church being the church that we're building people up. And then before you know it, you're at Starbucks, you're um, you're at a restaurant, you're hanging out with friends, and all of a sudden you feel like, hey, let's just try this out. And all of a sudden, let's build each other up. And now you're building up people, and you're speaking their identity, and they don't even believe their identity. And and now you're defending your identity, and you're defending your destiny because I know who I am. I know what God's called me to do, and so I can fight for you and who you are and what God has called you to do. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We're the fastest growing 
growing family on the face of this earth. We're not going home. We're hitting the streets. We're going to expand. We're going to go from glory to glory. We're going to go from success to more success. I'm the head and not the tail. And that's who you are too. Amen? All right, jump up to your feet. Father, I pray that each and every person here would be blessed beyond their wildest dreams and that they would use their blessing and their success for the, the establishment of your righteousness and your justice on the earth. We thank you for what you've deposited into our hearts tonight. And we say yes to what you are doing in Seattle. We say yes to what you're doing here in this room. We say yes to your kingdom assignment for our families and for our legacy, all for the glory of God. And everybody said... Amen. Hey, God bless you. If you need prayer for anything, come on up here. Almost anything. Come on up here. We'll pray for you. We'll stand with you. We'll prophesy over you. It'll be good. God bless you.